you have to keep on learning, but also you have to keep innovating, right? You have to make sure that you're pushing the envelope forward as soon as new technologies come available. How can I implement this to make my clients' lives better or and my life better? Welcome to the Leaders in Tech podcast. I am your host, David Mancella. This podcast has been created to acknowledge the people that are changing the world for a better place, specifically with leadership in technology. As we know, uh, the industry now runs on technology and to create technology it require great, it requires great leaders. And what a beautiful example as our today's guest. Dan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Dan, for the audience, can you please tell me your full name? Where do you live and what do you do for a living? So Dan Brunkwell, I actually live up in uh, De Pere, Wisconsin, just outside of Green Bay. And I'm the director of IT for a community bank here in Hortonville, Wisconsin. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so much for, for being in the show. Um, I had the pleasure to talk to you before this podcast, and I was just amazed about your life experience and how you got to be where you are. And being such as hands-on technologist at the same time that you're, you know, being able to become an amazing leader. And I think you're a, a great example of, of uh, how to how to run your life, how to lead your life. So let's look back in time then. Let's go back to high school days. Where, 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 where was in your mind on your last year in high school? What did you want to do with your life? I actually started dabbling in computers and reading about them in popular science uh, back in the early 70s before when I was still in middle school and actually was self teaching myself oh, uh, I programming. Think I lost your audio. And then when I got to, uh, by the time I got out of high school or my senior year, I pretty much had decided I wanted to go into this new field of computers and uh, the whole technology around computers and electronics. So this is incredible. So in the seventies, you already, you got attracted to computers already. Uh, how did that happen? Like what, what was your first contact with, with a computer? We actually, the computer access that I had in the early seventies, um, actually what I started out on with a Radio Shack uh, kit that just did bi binary uh, uh, logic for AND gates and AND gates. And then we, uh, in popular science, I'm reading about the uh, uh, these computer chips and these circuits and what they can do. And you get dazzled by the uh, blinking lights. And I wish it was the blinking lights because that's <laughs> the most excitement. Um, but we actually, I would, the, the fact that you could write a piece of code and get a machine to respond back uh, to create a, a, a game or a scenario or a, a formula that uh, needed a resolution and let a machine sit there and methodically work its way through that instead of doing it yourself uh, was intriguing. And so literally I would dabble with writing code when I was in grade school. We literally would walk up to the high school where we had a 15 character per second teletype that would <laughs> dial into a mainframe. You'd type in your program, you'd run it, you'd print it out, if you were lucky, you'd print it, you'd punch it, run it out to punch tape so you didn't have to re enter it. And that was my first exposure uh, to, to uh, using computers. I never quite saw it getting to where it is today. But it's like if you're an engineer, if you got the engineering mind set to see how things can make your life easier, then the evolution is just accept it and you just go with it and you keep adding to it. It's incredible. You know, my first exposure to computer science was the punch cards. My grand, my, my uncle was a, a senior IT manager for a large bank. And when they were compiling their programs, it would be with these punch cards. So at the end of the compilation, you had all these hundreds of cards. So he will bring them home and, and I will actually build castles and houses with them. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> I, I I just was just after the punch cards. Um, we had one at college that would run punch cards. Uh, but then I know that during the summer we would sit there with with uh, developing code and running out the punch tape on a, um, a mini computer in a tool shop. And we were so excited when we got the high speed um, tape readers and punchers. But then all of a sudden on the last year I worked for them, we actually put in an optic uh, reader that would read it in feet per second versus uh, inches per second. And uh, we weren't even to magnetic at that point yet. So uh, I've seen I've seen a lev an evolution and an appreciate and I have an appreciation for where the technology goes. Uh, the sad part is we have people who are going into college into the field today that really have no solid appreciation mm -hmm. for where it was as little as 40 years ago. I know, and you know, it's it's kind of sad because you and I had the privilege to see the evolution of computer science almost from its inception, right? Uh, for the people, I remember my daughter, she's 24 now, when she was born, the mouse was something that was about to become obsolete. And I remember when I saw my first mouse, it was in the 80s and it was, they brought a computer. I was in a computer science uh, faculty and they brought this brand new computer with a mouse attached to it. And we were like, what is that? Because back then before it was all text-based and before that, like you were saying, it was magnetic tapes, punch cards. <laughs> and all of a sudden we see this, I think it was an Apple, remember those Apple classics, the first Macintosh that they brought in that they look like a little square. And we we actually had a we actually had a lab at college, and it had a lab filled with Altair computers. Um, so in popular science, they were talking about the Altair computer with an 8080 processor or a Z80 processor and uh, a few K of memory. And getting that on a motherboard, you could actually wire yourself, and then they had it on a printed circuit. And here they actually had the Altair cases that I had read about in a lab. But the nice thing is you could open the case and you could plug wires into it and actually make little, uh, uh, you, you could get the LEDs and stuff to light up and, and do things as you change the code. They had one Apple computer in that lab. But unless you were a senior level student, you weren't allowed to touch it. That right. was like gold. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and today we talk about mean time between failure. We would code uh, 16, 8, 8 bit, 16, co 16 bit and 32 bit code to uh, minis uh, computers. We would jokingly uh, refer to it as mean time between uptime because they spent more time getting repaired than you could actually uh, get computing time on them. So it's like today, a phone is a computer and you expect it to work for two to four years without ever having a problem with it. And back in the days in the seventies, if you could get sometimes a couple of hours, <laughs> you, were lucky. you were happy. <laughs> <laughs> now we have 99.9% uptime guaranteed by the cloud providers, right? <laughs> yeah, the evolution has been great. Um, you know, and, was... and when technology works, it, it's it makes your life easier. But when it, it's like say, you know, if you really want to screw something up, it takes a computer. And when computers start going bad and you don't know where the failure is, uh, people don't have lost the skill to literally write their name, right. do math, uh, make change. <laughs> and if, if one <laughs> power goes out, you're, you're, you're done. And I, that's actually a, a tremendous risk in, in humanity, I believe, because we forget that we we have the sun providing electricity for us, but the sun creates storms and it takes one solar storm to fry all the electronic devices on Earth. One strong enough solar storm and we're done. 
and we're back to back to the 1800s in in a couple of minutes <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah people who don't who don't have that that respect for where it came from and are not embracing any of the skills uh so, so learn to plant a garden yeah it's like the basics it doesn't have to get complicated don't don't just hit the controller and watch tv on netflix it's once in a while you got to get out <laughs> get your hands dirty <laughs> go back literally. to the basics yeah literally and uh, you had the privilege to be involved in a farm too right uh dan what was your experience in farming so we started out as a family farm um we started out when i was in uh up until kindergarten uh we had dairy cows my dad actually was somewhat of an innovator way back then and that's probably where i got some of my um back cultural background for engineering from uh he was already progressive in uh, livestock uh, management and uh, but then he realized that with a dairy farm you have to be there every day twice a day to care for those animals and so uh when i was in first second grade back in the 60s he, he, we actually switched over to poultry uh egg production and so i learned to do math going on egg routes in grade school and making change for people and uh doing learning a uh, service basically at that time uh so that was a good experience and when we when i got out of high school we were doing we had about 10,000 laying hens and about 100 acres of land and we're doing about 100,000 in gross income when I got out of college, then for the next 20 years, we built up a, a, a commercial farm services business outside of our farm. So we started harvesting for people, uh, spreading fertilizer and, and uh, herbicide chemicals for people on their farms. And then we also expanded our operation from 100 acres up to 1,000. Uh, we changed our farm services uh, from basically nothing up to about 35,000 acres. And uh, we were doing this all with about six people. And uh, then I, because of the, in the 80s, when we started doing this, we were still on the leading edge of a lot of what now is considered the normal technology in farming but for crop spraying and guidance and gps that really didn't exist back in the early 80s so uh things that were available i actually spent time modifying equipment with uh existing off the shelf technology but then as it became available computerized technology to think make things more accurate and uh, then i also had the ability to uh, um, use write my own software to do poultry management we went from 10,000 laying hens uh, on in a on farm to 20,000 but we actually had another million under contract and then we also developed a patent for uh, reduced cholesterol eggs and um, so i've got some background in animal husbandry um, we actually sold a trademark to grand met so i have some experience in marketing wow. and wow. <laughs> we actually uh, did some franchising we had some people from europe and japan visiting our farm and looking at our technology so it, it, the embracing the technology creating the technology open the doors to the rest of the world. That's incredible. What a beautiful story on how do you can actually apply computer science to something as important as farming, because that's where we all get our food from, <laughs> right? I, I watch YouTube videos. I follow a few different farmers that are producing content on a somewhat weekly basis just to keep up with what I used to do and i probably left farming and went into computer um, services and engineering full time right at the time that um, the technology in farming really 
started to take off here about 26 years ago. But some of the some of the concepts that I actually pioneered are still in place today. And when I watch these videos of the current technology, I'm still amazed at how far it's come. But I also see my ideas uh, being used every day in farming across the, around the world. Uh, so for GPS guidance, how the monitors work, uh, um, certain pieces of mechanical uh, engineering that I uh, pioneered literally 30 years ago are still in production today. That must be feel very satisfying. I, 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 I wish I had my name on the patent is what I wish I had. <laughs> But still, you move the industry forward, right? It's, uh, I may not be remembered for it, but at least I, uh, every time I see it, I can tell people where it started. And the fact that I can explain it uh, gives me some credibility in knowing that I did do that. Um, but yeah, it's, and where it's gone to today in precision farming and the granularity of what uh, the technology can do. It, it is, even to me, it is amazing. Yeah, incredible, right? Um, of course, the then, I, I, then I watched the one farmer, she says, well, before you'd, 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 you'd hook on a corn planter and you'd, you'd go out and plant corn. And the gal, last week I was watching the video, she says, well, we hooked everything up. And then we spent three hours with tech support before we could make it move. <laughs> so like, in some ways, we've made our lives a little bit more complicated. <laughs> what what made you make what made you leave the farming technology business and go full time into just technology? There was some family issues, um, and it was the right time to uh, branch out and go into something. And, and even when I went into computer engineering and consulting, the people that hired me, they said, well, what qualifies you to do this aside from a degree in computer engineering? And it's like, if I'm doing farm services or I'm doing computer uh, systems consulting, it's two lanes on the same road. It's all service. Mm -hmm. And right. it all comes down to the customer's got a problem. You go out there and solve it. If it was custom farm services, someone's got something that needs to be harvested. You go out there and you make it happen. And so I really only shifted lanes. Um, I was doing computer consulting when I was farming for that 20 years, uh, helping small farms, municipalities, learn how to do bookkeeping and use a computer before there was an internet. And uh, it was kind of a natural progression and I kind of picked the right time to make that switch. And there was enough family members now at the farm to manage that. So it was, it was, a, it was a good time to move. And it, I, it happened right basically at the dawn of uh, the internet and then uh, the, the whole networking, wide area networking, um, I literally was allowed to absorb it and grow into it effectively as it was evolving. So everything for the last 20 years got me to the point where I could finally really implement what I learned for the last six years here at the bank. That is incredible. Um... What was your first project where you had to work with other people and how did you handle that? The first project for in, in the computer world? Yes, the the, where you had to work with other engineers or other developers and how did you handle that? Because it sounds to me like you were doing a lot of the stuff yourself on the technology side for the farming, but there wasn't much people involved around you, right? Yeah, I mean, for the first 20 years after I got out of school, there wasn't really, it was really standalone computers or dumb terminals, terminals talking to a mainframe. Uh, and so there, the, 
there wasn't that many people available to explain or to talk to each other and the computers were all standalone. You kind of were pioneering for that first 20 years from the eighties into the nineties and trying to figure out where is this going? Uh, the internet was that equalizer that made all platforms and communication, uh, um, be able to work together. And so, um, but when I got my, when I took the first job with the computer consulting company, the owner dropped me off at a site and said, here's, here's a company. It's got six computers talking to a Novell server and their print servers aren't working right. When you fix it, come back. <laughs> Just and, like that that. Was, and that was three days into my new job. <laughs> 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 and, and I'd not seen a network before. Uh, so it, uh, I, I had a resource at the, at the company that was a full-time developer. And this is right when software development, uh, slash computer science was diverging from computer engineering, hardware and networking. And even though there's still some overlap, they still are really two different, uh, areas of expertise. And uh, so it took about three, four or five years, at which point the guy that I leaned on as a resource finally said, well, this is that point where the student becomes the teacher. And then I started teaching him stuff about networking. So it, it just exploded going into the uh, late 90s into the 2000s. And the whole idea of how networking should have been done. Um, there was a lot of people who were experimenting and trying to do it. And in the early 2000s, it really got formalized. And then the people that were doing it on the ground, like myself, were basically writing that book on, well, this is what this is what we were taught, but this is reality. And mm -hmm. so even and then the advantage I had about being a consulting uh, systems engineer was that I could go from one implementation and then to the next one, I'd carry that knowledge, but then apply whatever the latest technology was. And then I just kept building on it. I didn't just repeat it. I made it better. And so it's like you, you, in computers, in technology, if you're not learning every day, you literally are falling behind. That's so true. You touch a beautiful point of wisdom. You have to keep on learning, but also you have to keep innovating, right? You have to make sure that you're pushing the envelope forward as soon as new technologies come available. How can I implement this to make my clients' lives better or and my life better, right? I, I have people call me on a weekly basis offering their services, managed services, offering to offload uh, the burden of managing a IT or a IT infrastructure. And there are so many people that have been put in the position of managing the IT infrastructure with no formal training in IT, that there is a opening for managed security and service vendors to and I used to do that effectively. So when they call me and all of a sudden they said, well, you must be overburdened. And I, I like to say, well, define overburdened. <laughs> and so on a good day, um, I mean, we're a small company. We have 60 people, um, a single uh, person running the IT department, but I have everything in house and every vendor that I picked for a specific solution I picked them specifically knowing that they had a support team behind them that was receptive and reactive. And effectively, though I am a one person uh, shop, my team is expanded by the back end support at each, at each vendor. Mm -hmm. So by picking each vendor specifically, my team is effectively hundreds of people. Exactly. with all all knowledgeable in their 
specific uh, area of expertise. So uh, my days now, after five years, six years of being here, um, literally on a good day, I can manage and I can plan for um, future enhancements. I'm not sitting there reacting to daily issues of repair and troubleshooting. Isn't that beautiful? Because that's another, another amazing fact. If you don't learn how to delegate and how to get the best people behind what you want to do, you will get stuck, right? Or and you get the, overwhelmed. Uh, well, <laughs> and the other thing is, is don't just pick a technology. Uh, the rule of thumb, 50 years ago, let the problem dictate the technology. Don't go out and get the technology and then try and solve a problem with it. Um, you know, if you, if you need to drive someplace by a car, yeah. not a horse, you know, it's exactly. uh, they'll both get you there, but not as well. And so the same with uh, picking, you know, Apple computer or an iPhone versus an Android versus they'll all do what you need it to do. But if the business model says this is the platform you need to be on, then that's the platform you need to be on no matter much, how much you like the other one. Um, so yeah, I picked the technology based on the need. I don't try and shoehorn our business model into somebody else's solution. And that takes a little bit of understanding. It's not like going to the first solution and saying, well, that's a that is an endpoint security that's a sim uh, this is a solution and i'll make it work sometimes you need to go two and three interviews or products down the road and all of a sudden the right solution presents itself and it's like that light bulb above the head moment it's like well yeah that is exactly what i'm looking for i don't have to change the business model um i literally had a client 40 some years ago who said why does every computer program make me want to change what I'm doing? Right. And I've taken that to heart and said, you're exactly right. It should make the way you do things easier. You shouldn't have to change the way you do things. You know what? That's why I run my company. So I run a software computer business. We write custom software solutions because my clients are exactly like that. They have amazing workflows that they have developed over the years but they are manual and they are looking for automation automation around those workflows and sometimes most of the times what they get in the market is a packaged piece of software that has a workflow that somebody else created that may not be the right solution for them you know yeah i and, and that <laughs> has been what i have done since i was in grade school um and, and my dad let us uh go out in the shop and experiment um i i can tell you i have had enough failures i don't advertise them uh some i don't even want to talk about <laughs> but they're they're funny to talk about after the fact but uh uh i've had some ideas that on paper look just brilliant and then I actually built one of them and it's like okay we won't even discuss that <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean what though? think about it you are an innovator right you created something that now if you had the patent for it you would probably be a multi multi millionaire but despite the fact that you didn't get didn't get the credit you deserve you push the industry forward. And the only way to innovate is to go through failure. How, how many times did it take uh, Edison to, cre to create the light bulb? 3,000 tries. <laughs> well, right. and, and, and that is, that's a cultural thing that I think we're, we're battling right now, globally. Um, probably started decades ago with let's be a participant and everybody's a winner you you if you don't have failure you won't know what really works yeah everyone thinks everything works and then when they have true failure they you can't deal with it you need to learn from it 
and move forward. So it's kind of in the culture now for the last uh, uh, six to 10 years that this is coming to a head. So there's some global issues going on. Because for, of that mentality. Right? Because of that mentality. It, it, not every, you know, the reality is not everyone can be a winner. And, but then if you can't be a winner, well, learn from your mistakes so you can win the next time. Then everyone exactly. moves ahead. But if you keep saying, well, I'm a loser and you don't want to try and get better so you can be a winner, then we don't move ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think we ruined a, a generation by that flawed mentality. I Guilty as church. I remember going to the soccer games of my kids in the 90s saying, everybody gets a medal. There is no losers, right? <laughs> What a way to, to misguide our generation. Because then when they actually face failure in life, they're unable to cope with it. They don't fail forward. They actually get stuck in their failure without knowing that it's part of life. I right. I coached soccer years and years and years ago with uh, 10 year olds. And I was told we all we did was teach the kids two plays, but we actually taught them a play and how to pass it and how to execute it. And I had senior coaching staff say, well, no, you're only supposed to teach them how to kick the ball. I said, well, then they don't win games. Mm -hmm. And if you want people to come back next year, they better have a good feeling about winning <laughs> yeah. or, or, or they'll do something else. And uh, so if you're going to teach a skill, if you're going to coach soccer, if you're going to coach them to do any life skill, teach them, teach them something that they can replicate and be successful at versus just trying mm -hmm. because best tries don't get us back to the moon they don't get us to mars um i mean I, i watch people like elon musk and how he's willing to blow up rocket ships but then he says well but then when nasa wants to build the ship that goes up and gets there the first time and you end up with so much development and decision by or by a committee that it never gets done <clears throat> and then you got someone who like elon let's build one see what's what happens take notes and if it works fantastic if it doesn't well let's build another one <laughs> <laughs> and make sure we don't do the same mistakes well yeah from the mistakes right so if you if you don't have failure you you really can't <laughs> there are people who don't make mistakes I haven't met him yet. Um, yeah, uh, and the first thing you can learn when you're coming out of school is like uh, it, it, years ago, they said, when you get out of high school, you should know you, you think you know everything. Mm -hmm. and, and when you get out of college, what you should have learned is you don't know anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you have that mentality to realize that, you know, there's always things to learn and you're not the smartest person in the room and you're open to different ideas um, or you're willing to at least be challenged on what your opinion is um, in, in a uh, civil uh, conversation, then everybody wins. Yep. And so, I mean, even when I was going to engineering school, they said, well, geez, engineers don't change their mind. It's like, <laughs> what if we're wrong? <laughs> Exactly. It's like, well, you should never admit you're wrong, but you can always change your point. And it's like, no, at some point, at some point you have to tell people, yeah, I was wrong. Uh, get me on the right path here and let's start moving forward. So when everyone can work together, then everyone moves ahead together. Everybody wins. And this whole process of, well, we're all participants and we try hard. No, we, we should all work together so we all win. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, what a beautiful way to recap how to live a good life, isn't it? You know, the people look at me, for example, and they see all my success and everything else, even this podcast, they have no idea how many times I failed and how many times I had to dust off and keep moving. So the, the, 
it's, it's, it's not about how many times you win. It's about how many times you fail and you have the courage to try again until you actually win, right? Of course, <laughs> it, it doesn't it doesn't hurt if you've got a uh, a significant other behind you to help you pick up the pieces when you're about to say the heck with it. <laughs> so I give a lot of credit to my, to my wife. Uh, I'll, I'll give credit to my family. I'll give credit to the kids um, because there was times when I failed to the point where it's like, well, you know, I could just get a regular job and go home at night and not worry about things. And it's like, well, but what's what's the challenge in that? Yeah. And when you lose that that when you lose that that fire <laughs> to, and I don't care if it's in your job, maybe it's in your uh, hobby. It can be in anything, but you got to have, you got to have a reason to get up in the morning. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be your job. Maybe it's taking care of your family, but if you don't have that drive to get up in the morning, then, then, you know, that, then you've given up. Yeah. And it's so sad, right? And I've been there in moments where I thought everything is over. And then, like you said, my wife comes up and picks up the pieces, right? brings me back to life <laughs> and, and, and then You're i realize right. who, and then i realize who's the smarter person in my marriage <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> exactly. I, i'm just there riding along she she's the one that's got the brains <laughs> yeah no it's uh, at the end of the day life is not easy it's very hard but it's a beautiful it's a beautiful life if you decide to make it beautiful right Yeah, that's uh, that's all my whole life right there. <laughs> and at some point, I got people trying to figure out when I'm going to retire, and it's like, I, I'm, I'm. If you're happy doing what you're doing, what's the need to change? Yeah, uh, it'd be nice to see more stuff, I guess. Um, but it's like there's still so much I need to get done. Mm. At, at quote work but there are days i don't consider it work this is fun talking to people like yourself uh, meeting other people in the industry uh, looking at different technologies seeing different things um, you know how i get paid for this <laughs> amazing you know <laughs> you're completely right i lost dan i lost my hope in retirement in 2013. I, I, I had the privilege to have a little taste of retirement. I was starting to take two, three months off every year. And don't get me wrong, like the first, the first couple of years was fun. I took my kids out of school. We traveled the world. The business was doing great. I automated, I hired up, I delegated. It was fun until it became very boring and then i realized that my my life became meaningless what a sad way to live and then i thought why would i ever want to retire fully like it's crazy uh, i mean like i'm gonna keep learning as long as i live and i want to keep adding value as long as i live because otherwise why am i in this world for if i'm not adding value and learning and if i get paid to do that even better <laughs> yeah there there is the there is the bonus um so yeah if 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 maybe retirement should be redefined as uh you're doing what you want and and you don't have to worry about the money yeah maybe for some people that's golfing for me it may be always helping somebody with uh something related to technology mm -hmm. even even if I'm not getting paid for it and I end up going and helping uh, other senior people uh, with technology and saying, you know, it's not as hard as you think it is, um, at least I am learning and keeping up with the technology, but I'm helping others. Yeah. So I'm still moving forward, but it, I, I have seen so many people who have retired and just decided to stop moving and it's it's uh you want to see a person get old in a hurry 
And I, I even know my wife and I always made the observation, we got married a little later. Uh, we were the oldest parents on the field uh, uh, when we had soccer kids out there. And I says, you know, if you want to, if you want to keep young, have kids. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you, you see people at 30 year olds with kids. You see people at 60 year olds with kids and they yeah. look to be the same age. Uh, I've seen people at 50 years old at empty nesters and they look old. Yeah. It's like, well, they're not having fun anymore. It's like, where, where, where is the, what do you do? Well, we get up and we make breakfast and then we read the paper. It's like, uh, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> Exactly. So I, I, I don't mind if I have to get up in the morning and, and, and pick dandelions out of the lawn. Um, but then ideally I will, uh, and the neighbors watch, um, I actually got sick of picking the dandelions out of the lawn. And so I brought some of my farm experience with me and I built a crop sprayer, a lawn sprayer for, uh, for my lawnmower. <laughs> And, um, so it's like, I know how to do this. <laughs> this doesn't, this equipment doesn't exist the way I want it. Let me build it. And so when I can still dabble like that, um, you know, it, it's a reason to get up in the morning. And if I can make my life easier with technology mm. and it doesn't have to be a computerized technology. <clears throat> it, it could be, you know, something as simple as put, you know, effectively putting a wheel on a, uh, on a, on a, on a cart, you know, geez, before we dragged it and now it's on a wheel, that's technology, mm. you know, put, pick the right technology for the right thing, but you made something better. Exactly. And it's like, don't, don't get carried away with the, <laughs> with the semantics. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Dan. Thank you so much for your time. This has been an eye-opening podcast for sure. Let me ask you one more question. If you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on earth, what would you write in it? I actually would probably steal the, uh, steal the uh, one that's sitting at the end of the soccer field here when I drive to work. It says, uh, smile and let the rest of the world wonder why. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> and now you will know why, right? Because you're still adding value. You're still inventing, creating, innovating, willing to fail, right? Uh, so that you can eventually win. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I am having more fun now in my 60s uh, than I had probably in my uh, uh, when I was a teenager. Is there things I could have done differently? Uh, you know, and if you want to be really philosophical about everything, uh, if I changed anything along the way in the last 40 or 50 years, I would not be where I am today. Maybe I would be further ahead. Maybe I'd be further behind, but I would not have met my wife. I wouldn't have my kids. Everything changes. So all of the successes and failures and relationships, whatever they were, if you're at a good spot today, none of that would have occurred with all the rest of that happening. Mm -hmm. That's, 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 that's enough to blow your mind right there. It's amazing. It's beautiful. You know, uh, you reminded me, I think it's on Psalm 139. It says that, before we were born, God wrote every single day of our life in his book. <laughs> and I'm I, like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, talk about destiny uh, preordained. Um, I've had coincidences happen in my life. I, I, one, there was a time probably 35 some years ago when I was out at uh, five in the morning um, started crop spraying for a farmer and my uncle was still working at a plant down the street from where this, uh, where I was actually working. So I was probably 10 miles from home on a different farmer's field. And what are the odds that 
I come up on a pass where I'm coming to the edge of the field, right in front of the road, that my uncle is sitting there looking at me as he's waiting to turn and go into the factory. It's like, you couldn't have planned that. Mm -hmm. And even meeting my wife, um, she actually went to school in the same city for college and went to the same bar on the weekends that we would go and visit with the, my buddies from engineering school. And I never saw her. And I wouldn't meet her for another 20 years. Wow. And so it's like, but we actually were probably rubbing shoulders, literally, <laughs> on Saturday night. Isn't that crazy? And this life is like that. Like, you remind me of the story of with my wife. I, She was already signed up to follow uh, pure sciences in school. She was signed up and paid for the, you know, the, the next year. And all of a sudden, her mom advised her that she should follow computer science because she's good. So she changed schools last minute. And she went to the school that I was attending. And the very first day in that school, I remember seeing each other and, and knowing we're going to be together forever. I don't know. Those computer people <laughs> I went to school with, they, they're all a bunch of geeks. Eh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I didn't talk to a lot of them for 25, 30 years. And, and now that I'm in, what, LinkedIn, um, I'm actually running across classmates from college. And it's like, well, I guess the world's not so big. <laughs> it's not so big. <laughs> Dan, thank you so much for your time. This is your podcast. You can come back whenever you like. Thank you for your wisdom. God bless you and have a beautiful rest of the week. Thank you. You too. Thank you for tuning in to the Leaders in Tech podcast. Check in next week to keep learning how to use technology and leadership to change the game. See you next time.